I just want to say thank you guys for having me. My name is Jason Moss, serial entrepreneur. Um, I want to just start this talk by talking about kind of the journey for each entrepreneur is always different. And I always say that a quote I heard, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. So for me, you know, I really never thought that I'd be doing what I'm doing the way I'm doing it now, but it started in a very, very unique way. How many of you guys ever had like your teacher or your parent ask you what you want to be when you grow up? Anyone? Raise your hand. And you guys said crazy things like, I want to be an astronaut, you know, I want to be Kobe Bryant one day. Well, maybe you're too old for that. But uh, for myself, I was seven years old, my dad asked me that. And when my dad asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, it was a very interesting situation. I took out a white piece of paper and I drew three different pictures of myself. One was me in a business suit with a suit and a tie and a briefcase. The second picture was me with a French Pierre cap, a paintbrush, and a paint palette. And the third picture was me behind a church pulpit with a crucifix behind me preaching. And so my father asked me in Cantonese, go, my leg, what's this? I said, well, Dad, Monday through Friday, I'm going to be a businessman. I said, Saturday, I'm going to be an artiste. And I said, Sunday, I'm going to be a preacher. So I would have never thought that that's exactly what I'm doing today. And it's a kind of interesting story. I'm talking about bridging East and West through talent and story. You know, right now, there's US and China trade relations. There's tension. There is issues economically, politically in the South China Morning Sea. There's cultures that don't understand each other, but I truly believe the only way to solve the world's issues, not through politics, is not through more capital, but it's actually soft power. It's through story. It's through talent. It's through people like ourselves, entrepreneurs, artists, whoever it might be that has something to inspire the world with. That's what bridges the gap. So right now, as you guys know, you're living in China, whether you're an expat or whether you're a local, is that the Hollywood entertainment and media industries are becoming one. And what we're seeing right now, the convergence of this is actually through entertainment. It's actually through core stories. It's actually through the stories that we tell, like as I was saying today. A lot of you don't know that right now Transformers did less money in the box office than it did in China. Aquaman here in China for the first week did more than the US. It's a very interesting time. And we're seeing this convergence happen. We're seeing the markets become one. What does this mean? Well, that was my story. There was me there as a businessman. There was me there as an artist. And there was me there as a preacher. But how did this happen? All right? That's the thing about being an entrepreneur. You never know how it's going to happen. All you can know is that you have to start. You got to start somewhere. And when you start, you got to just kind of let the universe, let God and your passion kind of just lead the way. Does anyone know who MC Hammer is? Too legit, too legit to quit. Baggy pants, can't touch this. Some of you are too young because you're born after the 90s. But if you're born in the 80s, this is the biggest rapper of all time. He was literally the only one to go double diamond. And he was my first boss. Believe it or not, how'd that happen? Uh, well, actually, uh, I was running a hip hop Bible study in the inner city of San Francisco. And MC Hammer had just literally witnessed Tupac die. He left Death Row Records, had an encounter, started preaching at a church. I started listening to him preach every Sunday. And I was like, yo, that'd be so dope if MC Hammer came and spoke to my inner city youth. So I chased him down for six months. I finally got through his security guards, met the guy, got him to agree, and he asked me, what do I do? Well, my first job out of high school was working at a tech startup across from Apple in Cupertino. Okay? And he said, what do you do? I said, I work at a startup. He goes, really? He goes, you're Asian. You must not use computers. Come work for me. I was like, MC Hammer? I was like, yo, I'm done. So I quit my job, literally became his assistant, and I didn't know that he was into venture capital. He was actually, if you lie, you guys don't know, he's investing in over 50 major startups. From Square to Dropbox, you don't even know right now that he's doing even better than he was before. But when I was meeting with him and he started bringing me along, we were at YouTube when it was five people. We are at Twitter when it was three people. We are at Salesforce when Mark Benioff was less than 10 people. Facebook when it was only 150 people. And I remember him telling me, saying, Jason, Hollywood's going down. Film industry's going down. Music industry's going down. Everything is going to digital. Everything's coming to Silicon Valley. Rich content, digital distribution, this is the future. He told me this in 1997. Okay? We're in the office, everything's wireless, and lo and behold, how I found my passion and my calling and my purpose, as Alan was saying, Alvin was saying right now, was 
We invested in this guy's first movie. If you don't know who this Asian guy is, his name is Justin Lin. If you know who Justin Lin is, he's one of the biggest directors in Hollywood. If you don't know what movies he's, in, he's directed, they're called Fast and Furious uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6, Star Trek, and now Fast and Furious 9 and 10. When we met Justin, he was literally just graduated from UCLA. We're at CES. Okay, Hammer meets him on the ground floor, checking out cameras, and Justin says to Hammer, you know what, I'm making my first Asian American independent film. I'm sick and tired of Asians being, you know, stereotyped in Hollywood as geishas and goonies and geeks and gangsters. Come on. Is anybody mad in here? <laughs> that ain't me, all right? And I'm like, wow. And he told Hammer, I'm making this real film about an Asian American experience, I just wanna keep in touch. Gets Hammer's number, three months later, we're driving to San Francisco. He calls Hammer, he goes, Hammer, I don't know what to do. I maxed out 10 credit cards. I'm 90% done with my movie. My parents can't loan me any more money. If I don't have X amount of money in the bank account tomorrow morning, they're gonna take away all my equipment, and I'm done. I can't finish this movie. And Hammer's like, what should I do? I'm like, yo, you gotta help my Asian people. He literally walked to Bank of America, I remember, wired just in the cash, nothing signed, and we didn't hear from him for a year. Didn't know if he stole it, like some Asian thug, like we didn't know what. And a year later, I'm online in the office and I see Sundance Film Festival, Roger Ebert gives two thumbs up to young Asian American director Justin Lin. The film gets picked up by MTV Films, Viacom distributes it, I'm like, hammer, he's like, no. Calls Justin, Justin's like, yeah! It's the first movie for John Cho, Hello, Hello, Harold and Kumar, you guys remember this movie? All right, this new movie, Searching. This was his first film, Bella Tomorrow. Sung Kang, the Korean guy in Fast and Furious. This was his first movie, the guy that keeps dying and comes back every franchise. You know what I'm talking about? And literally, I knew when I watched this movie as a 19-year-old Asian American, I said, this is the first time I've seen someone that looks like me, talks like me, and it's actually represented the right way. And at that moment, I found my passion. My passion was, I'm gonna represent Asian media in mainstream culture the right way. That was what I was called to do. Funny enough, I asked Hammer, I'm gonna go to UCLA, get my master's in film and television, and uh, literally, he said, go for it. And I told my Chinese pastor this. I said, I'm gonna go to Hollywood because I feel like this is God's calling for me. And my Chinese pastor in San Jose said to me, that is not God talking to you. <laughs> That is Satan talking to you. <laughs> Hollywood is the devil, right? And I'm like, what? And he's like, God call you to be pastor. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? And so I literally go to Hammer. I'm like, what should I do? And Hammer's like, look, Jason, Hollywood's always going to be there. If you go in the spiritual state you're in right now, those demons will eat you up. You won't come out alive. Build your foundation. Build your character. Do God's work. Serve the poor. If you go back to Hollywood, it'll still be there. I took his advice. I went and started my first startup, which was a... Mission, non for profit we went to 40 countries, established over 300 missions, schools, hospitals, and about five years of that in my life, I came back, I remember I was in China, Shenzhen, I'm seeing kids with smartphones in 2007 going in and out of the clubs, and I'm thinking to myself, there's half a billion young people in Asia, how am I going to reach them? And I'm like, I can't build schools or clinics fast enough, and that's when I knew I had to get back into media, I had to get back into music. I came back to LA, I found a little company with an Asian manager that managed Asian rap artists, and I didn't even know Asian rap artists existed outside of myself. <laughs> and I find this guy, and he's like, yo, I, I manage this rap group called Far East Movement. I'm like, who's Far East Movement? He's like, you know, they're like the Asian Beastie Boys. I'm like, okay, whatever. And they're like, yeah, I asked to manage this guy named Jin. Remember Jin, the battle rapper 2002, DMX? I'm like, yeah, 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 but he's washed up. He got dropped. And he's like, well, you know, I have this vision. Well, what happened was I saw his vision, I saw the talent, and I saw that there was something special about the time that we were in at that time. I invested into the company, and I remember this as a crazy story. Far East was gonna produce my album, but you know, he was like, yo, Jay, your rap's like, eh. And he's like, you're not Jay-Z, you're not Eminem, we don't know what to do with you. And I'm like, so? He's like, so, but you know, when you, you talk, when you preach, it's really powerful. You ever thought I was just like preaching over the music? I'm like, what do you mean, like talking? He's like, yeah, have any of your sermons on YouTube? I was like, yeah, I got a bunch. He's like, play that sermon over that hip hop and just see what happens. So he plays his beat over my sermon on YouTube. It lands in this crazy cadence. His hair starts standing up. He's like, yo, this is crazy. You're like Eminem and Joel Osteen, like smashed into one. He's like, cha-ching! <laughs> He gets me in the studio, I lace the track, one take, because I've been preaching my 10,000 hours. I, I did it in my sleep, nothing written. I'm done, he goes, yo, this is crazy. He's like, yo, we're gonna get someone to sing on the hook, 
and make it like a radio pop track. I'm like, who are you gonna, gonna sing on it? It's like, yo, I got this guy, he sounds like Michael Jackson, he needs the money really bad, he's broke right now. I said, like, what's his name? He said his name's Bruno Mars. I said, who's Bruno Mars? He's like, check out his MySpace. And I'm checking out his MySpace, I'm like, yo, this guy sounds like Michael Jackson. I was like, how much? He's like, 1,500 bucks. He'll write and record for you four songs next Saturday, done. Write the check, he comes in, laces me the track, records over it as a demo. I'm like, this, I don't need anyone else to sing on this. I put it out, it's a million views overnight. Next thing you know, one night after a show in K-Town, Far East Movement records a little song called Like a G6. Anyone remember this? Yeah, you party to it, yeah, you got crunk over it, yeah, you lost your mind or your virginity to that song probably. Anyways, so what happened was, we lost like a G6, and next thing you know, it's 15 million records later. We know what happens to Bruno Mars. That company becomes the number one Asian entertainment American company in all of Los Angeles. And then in 2012, another company that I started with, HTC Corporation, which Alvin knows about, I saw the bridging between East and West, and I said, you know what? If we're going to bridge Hollywood and China, China's pouring in billions. Hollywood's going to China. They're going wherever the money is. It's not about capital. It's not just about M&A deals. It's about talent. It's about stories. It's about IP. It's about quality. It's about what you can do that is so great that the world will watch. And at that time, I knew that there wasn't a digital media platform, and Vice was coming out at the time. BuzzFeed was coming out at the time. You had all that digital that was urban, Me Too, that was Latin American. I'm like, why is there not a digital media platform in Asia for youth culture driven by music? Because if you think about it, I grew up with Channel V in Hong Kong in the summer. Channel V's dead. No one even knows where Channel V is anymore, okay? MTV is gone. It's not cool anymore because they're not even playing music videos anymore. So I'm like, yo, if I'm like Sprite or like Coke and I'm trying to market to kids in Shenzhen that like skateboards under 21, there's not a platform that's cool that I can market my product against. And at that time, I was like, you know what? It's now the time. The time is right, East and West is right, digital is right, and premium content, and Asian stories and culture, and that's when we started 88 Rising. And so when I started 88 Rising at the time, I knew I had to find the right person, and so I found my co-founder, his name was Sean, he was working at Vice at the time, and I was like, you know what, Asian America's too small, I'm not trying to make this like a fobby Asian content platform, I want to make this a global celebration of Asian culture. So this dude came from Vice, I said, I know he can do it, we raised the capital, we launched it, we found this little rapper named Keith A, I don't know if you guys ever got crazy to this song called Ichima. Underwater squat. Squat, squat, squat. Anyways, so this song comes out and it just rips over America. We remix it, we launch it. Then we find this little rapper named Rich Chigga. Hello? Uh, his name is now Rich Brian officially. You can call him Mr. Rich Brian. But when he first came out, I was like, dude, this kid was 16 from Indonesia, homeschool, taught himself English by watching Wu Tang Clan on YouTube, wearing a pink polo shirt and a fanny pack. And I saw the video, I was like, yo, is this real? This, this is like Asian Slim Jesus. And then he was like, no, 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 but listen to him spit. I'm listening to him spit. I'm like, yo, he's got bars. Literally, we sign him. We do the Rappers React video, and it's just launched. From there, all of a sudden, globally, millions and millions now, over 10 million social following, multi-billion views, invested by WPP, Horizon Ventures, you name it, Blue Pole, Jack Ma, Joe Tsai's family office, but it's not about just the capital, it's about the passion that comes behind it, it's about what we're doing right now. Everyone say yellow is the new black. Yeah, there was Black Panther, and then there was yellow Black Panther. All right? I think what happened this last August, last year, was literally a tipping point for Asian culture. And right now, I'm telling everyone right now that yellow is the new black. Asia is the new cool. This is where technology is more advanced. This is where the largest population in the world is. This is the biggest market, marketing and capital wise. That's why every multinational company is in this city and in this nation. Right now, I'm telling you, Asia is the new superpower. Asia is the force that has to be reckoned with and respected. And it's not just about crazy rich Asians. It's about, at the end of the day, these three things as I leave with you. Follow your passion. Find something you're willing to suffer for. If you're willing to suffer for it, sleep long nights, lose your money, lose your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it is. Even turn your back on your family. Follow your passion. That's when you know you're passionate about something. You find a problem, you want to solve it, and you want to bring a solution to the world. 
Number two, know what you're great at. I know what I'm great at. I'm not operational. I'm a visionary. I'm a catalyst. I find other people to execute on my vision who are talented, to carry my values and see what I want to see, and I get them to do it, and I bring all the resources to it and then release it. Number three, empower others to execute your vision. Remember, a leader is not about you. Leadership is about everyone but you. Hello? It's about empowering others and maximizing what they're called to do. And when you are able to have a vision bigger than yourself, then you can truly live a life of significance and bring others around you to go out and make a difference in the world from east to west. Thank you very much. God bless. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Yeah, very nice speech.